Well, I know we had a lot of questions about this upcoming uh, upcoming presentation, but we are going to be doing a little interview uh, with our friend Brian, uh, who is one of the board members of the Portland Indie Game Squad, and he's an IP lawyer that handles a lot of uh, game clients in Portland and uh, all kinds of media clients. So. We're gonna, yeah. Uh, let's just let's just give it a shot. We're actually going to do this one live. Uh, we've been doing a lot of our um, our talent talks uh, uh, pre-recorded just for the sake of like organization and all those other kinds of things. Um, but we're actually going to do this one live because uh, it was uh, easy enough to coordinate with Brian since he's a fellow boardy and just one person out of all of the presenters that we have tonight. Uh, so. I'm gonna give him a little Discord call. Uh, we might need just one sec for setup, but uh, I'm gonna start this up. Hello, Brian, how are you? Hi, Will, I'm doing well, how are you? Doing pretty well. Um, we're here to talk about some legal stuff. Uh, everybody's got questions about it. Nobody likes to have to deal with it in a bad way, and uh, you're gonna help us get there just a little bit. Um, wondering if you might wanna start us off with kind of like who you are and what you work on and all those kinds of things. Yeah, sure. My name is Brian Wasitas, and I'm an entertainment attorney. Um, I work a lot in game. I guess what can I say? A lot of media stuff. So I mean, I work in film too, but um, I'm primarily working with people that are putting out media. So, I mean, a lot of producers, production companies, um, all sorts of things. I also I, I volunteer and on the board of directors with the, the Oregon Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts, which is an awesome organization. I always have to have to um, pitch it, and that's mostly where I do my volunteer work with kind of individuals and um, individual artists. Cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, go ahead. We we talked a little bit this weekend to kind of prep up for this about kind of like that basic uh, demystification of just like also just kind of like what you do. Um, so kind of like what's what's usually your goal when somebody is talking to you as a legal professional? Sure. Um, ultimately, I am here to help people and make sure that whatever you're doing, um, you're protected along the way and are able to do that kind of to the best of your ability. So um, I look at myself and I, I, the ideal relationship would be I'm a part of the team with mm -hmm. you and I should be um, able to kind of offload whatever uh, that work is and take it on myself so that you're able to focus on the kind of work that, that you do mm -hmm. and can sleep easy too because I, I answer questions and I can help guide you along the way. Um, and fill in the blanks. So, I mean, I, you know, there's a lot about game development I don't know, and I assume that's a lot of game developers don't know about the legal side of things, but with our powers combined, publishing deals. That's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I can speak firsthand to that. Um, so when you say, when you say like fill in the blanks, um, you know, when people say like, hey, I need like, I need to know what to ask people and I need to know this, like how does how does your role usually fit in with kind of, filling in the blanks versus kind of uh versus starting from scratch yeah so it's always about um just talking through goals a, a lot of my, my job is just kind of being a therapist in a lot of ways um, or a life coach <laughs> yep. maybe and um just talking through you know what what is it that you want is it just um you just want to make games as a hobby and and that's really it and just trying to make sure you're not gonna get any in trouble you, you won't uh, <laughs> or you know it's or do you want to work with people seriously is this going to be a part-time job or a full-time job and then we can from there um build out like what are you well you'll need an llc or maybe you won't need one um maybe you'll need contracts for working with contractors or collaborators mm -hmm. and things like that um and then i can build those out kind of based on what those needs are or i can help you kind of identify what your needs are if you don't know yet right yeah for sure yeah and i think that was something that we were we were talking a little bit about too with this kind of process of kind of demystifying what it looks like for you to come in as a team member and look over an agreement or something like that. It really does have to do a lot with you You are matching terms that people should have already talked about, right? Like, uh, as you're saying, you're kind of talking people through. And um, I know that we talked a lot about how when when people are getting ready to go to the legal stage, whether they're working with a partner or, the, or the, if they want to work with like a publisher or something like that, there there really is a lot of work that has to be done on kind of the, the side of the person who's coming to you. Like they have to know a lot about like what they want their timeline to be, what they want their budget to be, like things like revenue splits. Like these are these are kind of like industry issues that are separate from what exactly you're going to be giving advice on, right? 
Yeah, so I know a lot about each of those kind of pieces. I know how about about how they kind of work with other parts of a contract or how they work with development budget, budgets and milestone schedules and things like that. But um, you know, I'm I'm not there day to day with a developer, and so mm -hmm. I actually you know I don't I don't know what your bank account looks like, and I don't know kind of like everything like that. And so um, those there's kind of like the big pieces of, of, yeah, like what you're looking for in the relationship with the publisher, a little bit relationship with whoever it is um, that I can help then put to paper. Mm -hmm. um, but I do need some information brought to me first. And a lot of the information I think, um, like Pig Squad is such a helpful resource because a lot of people have gone through this stuff before. Um, so when you ask like, what's a good revenue split if you're, if you're getting in with a publisher, um, you have to, to answer that question, it's like, well, what stage of development are you in? Um, you know, what are you bringing to the table? What is this publisher bringing to the table? Um, and all of those things kind of influence ultimately uh, what the deal terms are. But then, yeah, once we have the deal terms, we want to make sure that that's actually in the contract that you're given. Um, I have been, gosh, I've been doing this for about seven <laughs> years or something like that, and th not once has a has a contract, specifically in publishing, has a contract come to me that 100% reflects. Um, those those deal points that everybody agreed on already. Mm -hmm. And that's not out of any sort of like malicious intent by publishers. It's just whoever you're working with, um, and this goes for really like any relationship most of the time, if you're working with a company, that's not gonna be the in-house counsel, whoever's doing their legal documents. This is gonna be someone that's probably like in marketing or some sort of like sales and, and uh, development side of things. And mm -hmm. so they're just gonna say, hey, send us the contract um, in-house lawyer, and then they will send it to you and then it's kind of on, it's your job to make sure that that um, all checks out, which is right. what I really help out with. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah, I guess, um, yeah, for from personal experience, at least, like like I said, things like budget and timeline, who is responsible for what, kind of like the project planning, what's your game like, like what do your milestones need to be for you to be able to get your game done? Um, like those are those are typically something things that like Brian, a person like Brian might not know. So uh, kind of being able to do your research and ask around and all those kinds of things to to bring that to the table for uh, for a legal professional is, is typically the goal for, for that kind of relationship. Um, and I mean, uh, also publishers aside, um, with regard to kind of like, I, I get a lot of questions from people in pick squad about collaborating with each other. So, um, saying just like, yeah, like if I go into a game jam, like how does ownership work out? Or like, Hey, I want to take this game jam project to the next step or, like I've been meeting with somebody at a coffee shop for the last three months and now we decided like, hey, we actually want to get this thing done and, you know, we don't have funding, um, but we know what we want to do and we don't, you know, exactly know the end or we, we have a goal for an end product, but we don't know exactly every step. Um, I've, heard, I've heard a lot of different uh, questions from people about like, how do you, how do you start that relationship or how should you start that relationship with regard to making sure that you own what you want to own or you can sell what you want to sell or you can drop out when you want to drop out? Like, how does that kind of look? Um, <laughs> On a, uh, they, maybe you start with game jams or something like that. I think that's a good so example. All of it, well, um, <laughs> it's kind of two pieces. There's like the business realities. There's a business mm -hmm. legal side of things. And then there's, copyright and copyright is what the the protection that you're given for creative works and mm -hmm. so it's a little bit similar in the sense of with a a partnership is which when people come together to do something including making a game um as soon as you're doing that with anybody even if it's kind of like hobby style that's technically considered to be a, a partnership from a legal perspective okay um it doesn't have to be like in on it uh, like everybody be like yes we are starting a business it's just right. that's the default you have you have done that already mm -hmm. um, yeah so if you're if you got you got contributors contributors on your google doc and all of the google doc is an integral to your project like pretty much everybody who who has done that who's been kind of party to this is is legally in a partnership you're saying yeah unless you've structured that otherwise i mean um I think people, when they think about contracts, they think about kind of these like really long and formal things. It doesn't have to be that way. It's, a contract is just any agreement between parties. And so, you know, if you have emails or if you're in like a Google Doc and or even whatever Discord mm -hmm. um, and are agreeing to certain things like, hey, you do this, you do this, or you'll own that and I'll own this, um, mm -hmm. that's a, technically a, a contract. It's probably helpful to have someone like me or like going through the OVLA to um, 
help you build that out more formally to make sure that it's kind of like matching with everything. And when I say formally, I don't, I don't mean like in garbage legalese. Um, you can write it very now modern. Now you hate the legalese. Way. Yep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to say everybody does, but everybody does not. But I, <laughs> we do. We do. <laughs> We hear. Yes. Um, yeah. So, so you can do that, and you can build it out that way, and um, you can become more formal, like mm -hmm. starting with a, an LLC or corporations and things like that. And so that's important to think about, especially if you're going to be um, taking it into any sort of like commercial endeavor. On the copyright side of things, with any sort of like um, so protection on the creative works, mm -hmm. this one's a little bit more um, involved. It's uh, so the default is, which I don't love it, but um, with copyright. <laughs> so if anybody, if you're making a game, and you have a few people coming in, right? You have someone doing sound design, you have someone um, doing software and coding, and you have somebody doing maybe like art assets and things like that. Um, if someone comes in and is doing like 80% of the work, and then you have another person come in um, and they're doing, I don't know, let's say 15, right? And they have one other person doing 5%, and I'm pretty sure that adds up to 100%. But don't quote me because it's been a long day. You're good. You're good. <laughs> With copyright, the default is everybody's just a joint owner um, at the same levels. Mm -hmm. So everybody would own that copyright the same way. Royalties would have to be split one third with everybody mm -hmm. involved, um, unless you have agreed to otherwise. So that right. that default is pretty in, intense, um, especially when you're working on smaller games or you know if someone primarily is um, making everything, even if it's like ninety eight percent and two percent, that's going to be a fifty fifty split uh, unless you agree to otherwise. Mm -hmm. Right, so for sure. those are the things, um, and you can modify those later on. Right? Uh -huh. like yeah, yeah, to, yeah. You're never locked like, in. You can always, you can always yeah. update things as much as you want. You can even a big, hearty formal contract. You can have an addendum to it or something like that. Right. Yeah, of course, and I think that's an important, um, important thing to note is that, like, really, what I'm doing and what the way, with the way that the legal system, not the system, but the way that legal like contracting everything works. Um, is we're just talking about people and we're talking about mm -hmm. relationships and we're talking about making sure that contracts reflect that and making sure that the contracts help relationship, uh, relationships progress. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, if, it, if at some point in time it's like this contract isn't working for us anymore, and that, that means everybody, mm -hmm. right? Like there's usually some that kind of has an upper hand in, in some way. Right. But um, theoretically, at any point in time, you know, you could bring up like, hey, let's modify this contract and, and you can do that. But um, going back to kind of like, what should you watch out for? Just keep these things on the radar because that, these things happen immediately when you start working with people. Mm -hmm. um, so you want to address it sooner than later. Right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I think just uh, from personal perspective too, with working on personal projects and stuff like that, like I, th I don't think, be, I don't think like super hawkeyeing that stuff and like fearing it is super necessary. Like I, I know that everybody's like a huge fan of their own ideas and stuff like that. But when it comes to something like a game jam, like, like Brian said, like you can always change these relationships later. Um, there's very, very few cases where somebody takes a game jam game and then they sell it and make a big jillion dollars kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, th I think a lot of people always kind of have that worry about something like copyright in the back of their mind. But um I, I would say if you just get to a point where you need to start talking about it and you want to actually like make a move, then you can talk to somebody like Brian or, or uh, Brian can introduce you to people too. Or you can talk to, as Brian suggested, like other people in the community to say, how did you handle this? I know you're not a lawyer and you can't give me legal advice, but what do you recommend? So, Yeah, yeah. I think it's almost more important on the copyright side of things to be thinking about like, are you utilizing any sort of assets or whatever from somebody else? Like, mm -hmm. are you pulling in different things to your game? That's probably where more liability, I mean, probably it's like definitely where more liability is going to come into yeah. play. Then as far as like, I collaborated with somebody, we came up with something new. Um, just because a lot, and this is maybe, I mean, we could talk about this stuff for probably hours, but right. <laughs> um, on a copyright side of things, you know, the idea of the game is generally not going to be protected. It's just like what you've made. And so mm -hmm. that's what you hear about like roguelikes or whatever else, you know, like it's, it's there's a style that's not going to be able to be the protected. genre isn't anybody's yeah yeah right um cool yeah i think i think that's good what about what about like publishing another another question i get a lot from people is like what do i gotta watch out for when i'm working with a publisher like what are the basics and kind of like what what do i need to talk about uh before entering relationships uh with with publishers and or just like what do you notice coming out that usually 
isn't ideal for somebody coming in as a developer who maybe this is their first rodeo as uh, as a business or something like that. Sure. I mean, you will want to make sure that on your side of things that you have everything kind of nice and tight. So mm -hmm. um, that usually means having an LLC. And I, I see my I screens over here. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, there's some, there's some questions about LLCs that I'll, I can go through. But, um, you know, it means having a place where your game lives. Mm -hmm. um, and usually that's going to be an LLC. But then also, um, if you've worked with any collaborators that you have those contracts. So just making sure that everything is is clear for use by that publisher. Mm -hmm. So not it doesn't right. have to necessarily be totally owned by you, but um, making sure that your like licenses to music are all, all mm -hmm. cleared out and everything like that. So that the publishers are going to be able to come in and actually use this game without having to worry about anything like that. Right. Yeah. They're not, they're not, uh, they're not indirectly infringing because you didn't tell them that you don't own something that technically they just bought from you or or whatever else yeah right right and then after that i think um as far as working with the publisher i guess it's just helpful to know that it's, it's um that's another relationship mm -hmm. and it's something that you need to talk through and i think that the this goes with all contracts but the contract that they give you mm -hmm. is kind of just like the starting point I mean, you know, the major deal points should be settled already, and those need right. to be reflected in the contract. But, um, you know, you want to make sure that if we're talking about, like, merchandise rights or that those kind of, like, royalties right. or whatever, if it's in the contract and you don't like it, um, bring it up because mm -hmm. every contract's negotiable. Uh, and those are, you know, a worst-case scenario is they just say no. Right. And if for, if for you, if that's a deal-breaker, then you don't have to take the deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's super important. I think not only is is making sure that you have your ducks in a row ahead of time going to be the the way that you get this through but also yeah i mean knowing knowing what your deal breakers are specifically is another kind of like tier of understanding what your contract might need to look like and you also uh i i've learned this uh, a lot over the last couple of years like understanding the deal breakers of something like a publisher is really important too um i know that you brian have given us uh with with rose city games just like specific advice around just like you know what like this part of the contract i don't like it but it's as you say it's about the relationship like they're huge they're not going to want to run it by their lawyer like this is their stock contract so like i don't like it but we can live with this are you okay with living with that? And we and we kind of move on. So uh, yeah, yeah, I've, I've definitely experienced that. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you can get exactly what you want. It's mm -hmm. kind of rare, and I think most of the time it's about um, you know finding the right balance between things that you absolutely want, things that you can kind of give on, and then that's true of the publisher too. So I feel like you kind of have you have like your negotiating points, and you can spend them here, and you can spend them over there, right. um, but you kind of want to <laughs> choose wisely about. Uh, where you're really putting your foot down on, on things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Um, yeah, and I think there's another, the, the question in chat is specifically about like uploading something to a platform and getting revenue from it. So say yeah, sure. I, I make something and I and I upload to, I upload to itch and I have it for sale and, you know, I might make $10, I might make $10,000. What are the what are the benefits at that kind of like starting level for having an LLC versus not having an LLC? Um, one of the main benefits, I mean, so if we're not talking about like making a ton of money, right? Um, because when you start making a decent amount of money, there's tax reasons that you might want to have an LLC. But, okay. Yep, that's good. But to know. initially, initially, I think um, a reason that you probably would want to do it is. If you're looking for that kind of limited liability that an LLC gives you, um, mm -hmm. without going too deep, arguably that, that kind of doesn't matter on a really low level. Like, sure. Like if you're only making 10 bucks, you're probably not going to benefit from the liability, the limited liability that an LLC offers you, um, which makes a lot of sense. Right. And I mean, I think that kind of fits in that, what I was saying earlier about, you know, don't don't pull your hair out over every game jam when you're thinking about copyright. Like it's, it's, you know, low stakes starter enough. You can always change it later, um, to where you can, uh, you can flesh that out, but, uh, sorry, continue. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's, um, the likelihood of you getting sued is, is very low. Mm -hmm. Um, especially if it's just like for game jam stuff, there's a mm -hmm. lot of good, like legal theories about either fair use or about like personal use and just mm -hmm. saying like, there's just not, there's not infringement at this level. Um, and so most likely, if, if someone was mad, you might just get like a DMCA takedown or something like that, right? right. Like your game just kind of comes down, but you're not personally going to be sued. It would just, it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the benefits would be 
maybe if you've worked with somebody, had collaborators, and you want to like be very clear about who owns what, mm -hmm. an LLC can help with that. It can yep. because it's it says who the owner is for that thing. Um, and if that's linked to you and only you, then that's a really good argument that it's just owned by you. Mm -hmm. um, it's a good way to also, in the long run, kind of um, set yourself up too to have properties that are ready to go if if they do need to be sold off or anything like that. Right. And so, in Oregon, it's the hundred bucks a year to have an LLC. Mm -hmm. And so I. I tend to recommend that it makes a lot of sense for people, but you know, hundred bucks, a hundred bucks. And so if you're a hobbyist, it might not make as much sense, but sure. if there's revenue involved at all, or you have like multiple properties and it could make sense. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And what does, when, when you, you're, you're talking about when you get an LLC, you get limited liability applied to this, this organization. Can you describe a little bit like what that does? Um, what, what, li uh, what liabilities you are limited from or anything like that? Yeah, it, um, when we start getting like smaller kind of hobby things and like single person, there there are some kind of legal theories about, you know, maybe it doesn't provide as much protection as it might. But if you're in business, um, ultimately we're a limited liability company and the same with a corporation. So setting up some sort of legal entity other than yourself, mm -hmm. um, what that does is that your business that you're running it through or the assets, whatever that you own that mm -hmm. are in that business are separate from you personally. Okay. And so if there were any issues, someone wanted to sue you or whatever, um, they wouldn't be coming after your personal assets. It would just be right. you know, limited to that business asset. Um, and so, I mean, you could bankrupt it and walk away, I guess. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I mean, I've seen, yeah. I've seen clauses in contracts before where it says, uh, I mean, there's, there's additional liability that you can just kind of add into your agreement with somebody like a publisher or a client or anybody saying, you know, the, the liability of this project will not exceed uh, the the amount that this project was worth in the first place. Um, and it, it sounds like even yeah. if you were even if you were sued for damages or something like that, your your company assets, things registered under your company, the uh, maybe your company bank account um, would be the thing that was liable, not your personal house and uh, your personal belongings and your personal bank account and everything like that. Does that sound right? Yeah, I mean, as um, yes, uh, correct. You'd also want um, just like thinking of all the different things now. Sure, but yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think you'll want an LLC. I mean, if you're going to be like working with anybody too, and, mm -hmm. um, so certainly if you're going to have like employees or contractors or anything like that, then it's going to be pretty important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Um, and another small follow-up on the LLCs we have in the chat here. If you if you have an LLC for the year and you choose not to renew, what happens to those uh, properties and assets? Um, so I should also say that LLCs right, and corporations and those kind of things, mm -hmm. yeah. So those are all state-based entities. There's not any sort of like national things. So mm -hmm. um, most of what I'm talking about is going to be in Oregon. Um, but each state has its own laws around that kind of thing. And they, mm -hmm. they all operate fairly similarly, but I do want to make that distinction. Um, so an Oregon LLC is an Oregon LLC and it's not like Washington right. or anything like that. Um, in Oregon, what happens is that if you don't pay or if you, yeah, it, it, it goes in what's called administrative dissolution. And so um, mm -hmm. it is the state saying you haven't kept this up to date. You're not allowed to use this anymore. So it no longer provides limited liability to you. Got it. Um, while you have it, going on so it, it technically still exists it mm -hmm. exists as an entity separate from yourself still and so if there's assets um, that it owns it'll still own those separate from you until you transfer those back to you mm -hmm. um, you have the option to kind of bring it back to life for a while um, I think about five years you have to pay back fees and stuff like that but right. but you can bring it back to life and um, interesting yeah, so yeah kind of a little bit like of insurance on the back end right yeah oh. interesting cool you just reminded me of the insurance thing. I was going to say with one of the things like LLCs and corporations, um, those are just kind of one tool in the toolbox for limiting liability. It's like you talked about in contracts. That's another place where we'd want to limit liability. Mm -hmm. um, so just, yeah, capping damages, things like that. And then also um, when you're really getting into doing this for real, um, that's not for say. If you're doing this for like your job, yes. um, I guess I should say. Yeah, uh, that's you a good would way also get. It. Yeah, because everybody here is doing it for real. Yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, small projects, big projects, it's all real. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it's all equally important. But if this is your job and your livelihood, um, you'll probably want to get insurance for that too. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of like the trifecta is like LLC, good contracts, insurance. Yes, excellent. All right, cool. Um, 
and I think here, sorry, I had one question about freelancing as well. Let me find that one really quick. Um, oh, and I oh, guess, I, go ahead, sorry. Well, to the chat comment, like, yeah, you want to treat your business as a business. Um, do not use your business card for personal for personal stuff. Um, that's one of the things that, especially when you're getting, like if it's a single member LLC, that if you really commingle funds and stuff like that, then you can lose that limited liability. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't think it ha I mean, yeah, most things settle, so you don't really see it go all the way to like a jury making these decisions. But um, but yeah, that's true. You you definitely want to treat it as something separate from yourself. Mm -hmm. Right, for sure. Um, and I guess another kind of question that's kind of similar to this. I mean, working with working with other people, working with publishers, and then also kind of like working for clients too. Um, somebody had asked, uh, what are kind of the top three things I need to uh, maybe do to protect myself? uh when when freelancing i would assume something like an lc is one of them llc good contracts insurance <laughs> there we go that's all we need um i say just be aware i mean if it's on your radar and if you're asking those questions you're already in a pretty good spot mm -hmm. i think it's important to be kind of thinking about those i think i think you're also right you've said a couple times that you don't want to get so caught up with it that um you're not making anymore yeah yep so Definitely keep making. And then also, um, I mean, know that you have resources around. I mean, even Pig Squad's great. You can always ask questions just generally. I mean, people have been at every stage that you can think of throughout yep. this kind of process. So um, people should be able to help guide you in those in those ways. Mm -hmm. So I would just remember, yeah, it's like if you're working with somebody, um, figure out what that relationship is. Is it, Are they a contractor or are they kind of part owners and things mm -hmm. like that? And um, uh, yeah, don't go years without <laughs> without kind of talking about those things. Yeah, so. right. Yeah, just like kind of jumping in. Um, I had another kind of interesting question. Um, somebody somebody had asked, uh, when we were originally asking questions for this uh, little panel, uh, I've heard stories of people breaking contract and walking away, uh, and nothing happened because it was too ex expensive to pursue something. Uh, how can I plan for my cause to be enforced uh, regarding ownership of IP, money that's owed to me, et cetera? Yes. So uh, again, kind of going back to contracts, um, there are clauses that you can put into a contract that if you need to enforce them, actually give them a lot of teeth, like attorney fees. Mm -hmm. um, so that if you do have to sue, that is not a cost that you're going to incur ultimately. I mean, granted, if someone if that you're suing has no money, then that's that's that. Right. <laughs> but um, yeah, so there's there's real world uh, parts of this as well. But um, yeah, so there's there's ways that you can kind of figure out, and I call it like on the back end. So things like really have fallen apart that, that you can kind of rely on those um, mm -hmm. those clauses. And then the other way is it's it depends on your perspective. Like, are you the one making something and someone's paying you, or are you the person paying to have something made? Because those ultimately what you want is going to be different depending on what right. side that you're on. So if you are paying somebody to make something for you, ideally to limit your risk, right? You you don't pay until you get the thing. And so that way, if you don't ever get the thing, um, you haven't lost any money. Right. Cause, cause I've heard you say before that like, if you, if you pay to, and kind of like trust somebody, but nothing comes through, like it's really difficult to get that money back. Right. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about like, yeah, if someone just ignores you, then um, having to go through the contract and like enforce it that way is, uh, it's, you just don't want to be in that situation. I mm -hmm. guess is the easy way to put it. Yeah, yeah. So it's um, it's much more about enforcing what you have in the first place rather than making exceptions and and uh, kind of not like going step by step to decide if someone's good or not. It's it's better to just follow the contract every time, kind of thing. Yeah, and you can make it. Um, the meeting in the middle would be like, let's set out milestones, right? So that there's kind of incremental payments for things getting made. Um, and so people just like aren't waiting on, I don't know, what, like a net 90? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's, an, I mean, another thing, if you if you get into um, doing this as a living, you'll probably see payment terms that are pretty far mm -hmm. down the line. So um, those are things you can negotiate, but ultimately you just need to kind of budget for it too. Right. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Um, a, yeah, and then the other part. part of this too, which is like the interpersonal relationships part of contracts is that um, ideally you should be checking in with people, um, making sure that everybody's happy and on the same page. Ultimately, a really good contract 
is supposed to do that initially. Mm -hmm. So the contract should say, you know, what you want, what the miles, milestone schedule and delivery uh, requirements are. And then just kind of keep track of that stuff. Make sure mm -hmm. you're having meetings, make sure that um, everybody's happy and delivering because, um, yeah, I mean, ultimately you don't want to have to enforce a contract, right? Yep. Yeah. That kind of means things. Always worst case. Aren't, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, things didn't go excellent if you're um, like, look at the contract. Yeah, um, yeah. And I think that's something that's something interesting that I've actually learned uh, working with Rose City Games and everything like that over time. We've had like many, many clients and partnerships where we go over the contract, we work on making sure that it's everything that we want to agree to and uh, we need to, and then, and then three months down the road, somebody on on a team forgot like oh yeah this thing is due or like yes we will give you this money when this thing comes in and and yeah in enforcing those and or just kind of like reminding and having a conversation and treating it like a relationship is really really important because i've i've definitely seen many situations where people are like oh yeah but that's the legal document like we had to do that and it's like yeah, but that's what I'm planning my whole like livelihood on right now. Like I have to get paid at this time. We are, you know, our whole team's working on this thing because of the contract. Um, you know, it's it's really important to kind of cycle that information back in with your project planning. It's it's a pain because it's like, yeah, you know, you have yeah. to get through a whole contract and you have to negotiate and it's and it's sometimes worrisome to uh, try to push back on something. And then oh great, we have this contract signed. We we can move forward. We can keep working. No big deal. Uh, it's it's still really important to come back to, I mean, you don't have to look at it as a contract when you come back to that, but the details in that contract, you just have to constantly come back to and say, yep, like, this, this isn't just our contract, this is our project plan, this is this is the the word that we are following. Yeah, so. right, right, yeah, I mean, you're not, usually when you're talking about, like, disputes, they're not coming from, like, oh, the jurisdiction for this contract it says this state. Yeah, it's, it's because of deliveries. It's because of payment issues. Um, it's because of approval issues. Whatever. And so um, those are the kind of things that you, I think, when you're keeping up on the contract, mm -hmm. you're really talking about the scope, um, which is healthy. It's healthy to do that, and mm -hmm. it's um, it also helps prevent scope creep, which would be you know yep. people asking for things that are outside of what the contract says and what you initially agreed to. Um, and I think you just, when this is what you do um, for your job, you get you get kind of used to it. Yeah, for and sure. I think anybody, yeah, anybody that is is serious and doing a good job, like in this industry, is not going to criticize you for for saying like, just making sure we're we're good with the schedule. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just just meeting everybody's expectations and things like that. Mm -hmm. I think it's it should be expected. Yeah, yeah, and I think doc documentation works really well with that too. If you're having oh, yeah, sure. a production meeting and you take notes on something like. That's that's super important for just backing up the idea that you're just following the plan and you're doing something that everybody agreed to. Yeah, having working docs is a a very good idea. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, okay, I got like a tiny a tiny random one that uh, we we barely we barely skimmed on earlier. Um, somebody was asking about both kind of accidentally like. I've, I've heard this question multiple times before how how to prevent yourself from accidentally infringing on someone else's thing like I, I don't know if there's really much you can do about that what's what's kind of your thought on that like I have an idea and I'm trying to design this character and oops I find out way down the line I've done all this work but it looks so similar to this other thing like I'm worried what should I be worried about yeah that's there's not like a firm line as like, this is the way to make sure that it's 100% not infringing. Sure. But if you're trying to set yourself up for having like the best argument that what you've made is original when you're, especially when you're like making something within um, an art style that is fairly common mm -hmm. or whatever. So it's like inevitably going to look similar to other things. Right. It's just to have as many um, points of reference as possible. So like, very, you know, several different things that you're kind of referencing to to create your own thing. Um, because uh, in most of the major like court cases where infringement is found like on a major thing, people will just say, mm -hmm. well, I was inspired by this one thing and that's why I made it. Um, that's right. not, <laughs> that's not great. Not you great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You want to say, you know, there's uh, all sorts of things that I like and it wasn't just mm -hmm. a singular thing that I was trying to kind of mimic and copy. Yeah. That's, that's really funny because I think that's just generally extremely good creative advice. <laughs> 
<laughs> I think I think a talk we're going to be hearing later tonight is about uh, developing stories and pulling from your inspirations and making sure there's a lot of them rather than uh, doing doing a single permutation. I think so. Sounds like that's healthy both from a uh, a legal yeah. kind of uh, kind of ownership perspective as well as a uh, building myself as a creative perspective. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Cool. Um, okay, and then a tiny a tiny tail on that question, and then I think we probably have to wrap it up unless uh, we could probably take one more question from the chat. If that's okay with you, Brian. Um, oh, yeah, but one question before then is uh how does how does music yeah how does uh music sampling work if like like one i know that in the music industry people sample stuff a lot but i had a question specifically like yeah but what about like you sample it for a song that is then in a game like how does that work sampling (laughs) (laughs) this one's a pain um it's a pain okay that's good good precursor Ideally, this is one of those places like if, if you what's your risk tolerance, right? Like mm-hmm. how how interested are you in exploring uh, <laughs> how far you can take sampling? Um, if, if the answer is I don't ever want to receive a cease and desist letter ever in my life, then pull from licensed libraries, like just pay mm-hmm. for a license to something and, and use things that are pre-cleared for whatever the plan is. Um, mm-hmm. Because with music sampling there's nothing built into the copyright law about what the right amount is or right. that's true of fair use laws as well and so it's kind of we're just relying on court cases to kind of tell mm-hmm. us what um what what judges are feeling like right now yeah yeah you're looking like at where this kind of pa- you're looking at past court cases to see what actually flies because that's going to actually influence whether or not you are actually infringing in the future right yeah and so there was a big bash like uh backlash probably the 90s from courts and um the rule of thumb at that point in time and probably for the past like i don't know 20 or 30 years um was just don't do it sample nothing Mm -hmm. unless you wanted to kind of like play with fire i guess right yeah that that has (laughs) since thankfully started to change because i think i think that's the right analysis is that um with fair use we're looking at things that are transformative so like it's what you're creating different and new and have you transformed um, from the original usage mm-hmm. and so there's some court cases now that are coming out again this is not like across the board but it's I think it's a good example of where things will go mm-hmm. um, are, is that like in other types of fair use you can take little little pieces um, from the song as long as it's not like the key piece of the song or like mm-hmm. very very obviously from the song so you can just, like, take those little pieces and start making something new out of that and that is looking to be clear and it's already clear in a few different areas um but when you're talking about like longer samples certainly if it's like the key piece of a song it's going to be difficult to do that um, right and have a good argument that it's fair use Mm -hmm. right and so that's how that works and then when you pull that into games it works the exact same way cool okay so it's the exact same way (laughs) yeah that makes a lot of sense yeah i mean you, you could go further into fair use and like if the song somehow works into the game and there's like critique and narrative or whatever else that's sure. all interplaying together then there's an there, there's arguments there that is fair use but that's gonna be like every case by case basis like fair use always works and it's just um it's just riskier so i mean if you're trying right. to make something that is guaranteed not to ever get like dmc8 or anything like that then um yeah just get licenses especially because there's so many um good indie people like making stuff i, I think there's just yeah a lot of opportunity for that. yeah i was gonna say i think i think um that's just kind of a general good broad statement to say about any aspect of games, especially with regard to how like the unity asset store works, you know, people Mm -hmm. put their stuff up there for sale. You can use it. You can use like a code library or uh, a 3d model or a texture or like there's so many things that you can use. And a lot of the times they'll all have their different licenses. And basically it's, it's kind of summing up this whole, conversation that we're already having around like it's essentially a relationship like you're reading what somebody says is okay and not okay to do so you have to follow what they say if you're if you're purchasing this license versus this license or number of seats in software or uh where where you need to credit things or any of that kind of stuff so yeah, yeah that I makes think a lot of sense a lot more um music available for games too um game music was kind of just like ignored by the music industry for a really long time uh-huh. and um <laughs> it, now everybody's got their eyes on games and yes, so they do. i mean even you know twitch is starting to like get wise to what they need to do and, and paying out people that need to be paid and, and deserve to be paid mm-hmm. and so 
Um, you're starting to see a lot of people that didn't think that their work had value in this industry that now are realizing that that, that it does. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's way easier just to license out your tracks and get money that way than yep. kind of like, you know. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like, so I think you're going to see a, a lot more music be available for this kind of work. Totally. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, already people are making really interesting, um, like ha making a really big spin on the idea of like a solo artist contributing to a game where in a game like Crypt of the Necrodancer or something like that, Danny B organizes many artists and handles all the licensing and gets everybody on the same page to contribute to a single game. And that's why he, he makes the big bucks because he handles all the licensing for that and makes sure that everybody's talking and all those other kinds of things. So yeah. Um, anyways, sorry, kind of tangent, but yeah. Is there anything else that you want to uh, kind of end on or any other last bits of advice or anything like that? Um, yeah, I'd say just like, don't be afraid to ask questions. I think if you, if someone gives you a contract or you're just like unsure of kind of what to do, I would ask, ask them if they know what they're doing. And if the answer is no, then that's probably a good, a uh, good uh, chance yeah. to talk <laughs> that out. Yep. Um, because uh, yeah, I mean, you see that in contracts a lot. It's like, Hey, what does this do? And the party's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe we should figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before we yeah. sign this thing, which maybe says something bad for you. <laughs> Yeah, and that's, I mean, the asking questions goes the same for, like, the community, too. So don't mm -hmm. ever feel right. bad about reaching out to people or, um, you know, reach out to me if you have questions or mm -hmm. Oregon Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts or, like, all these really great resources out there that are there for you. And Because um, I think ultimately people, at least in this community, I do, I do feel like the, I mean, Pig Squad has such, like, a supportive community that's really nice. But, you know, people really want to see each other succeed. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, that sounds awesome. And I think an, another important part of that is that, like you said, there's all kinds of skill levels in Pig Squad. And there's a there's a lot of like long, long, long term professionals that have been hanging out in Pig Squad channels and doing game jams and stuff for a long time. So cool. Well, alrighty. Uh, thanks so much. Let's get some uh, digital applause for Brian um, for coming on and answering all our questions. That was great. Thank you so much. Yeah, I had a blast. Yeah, it's good. Um, I'll be in the chat. Yeah, I was just going to say, if you want to do us a favor and uh, link uh, OVLA in the chat oh, yeah, totally. um, mm -hmm. and any other resources that might be helpful for people, go ahead and just link them in there and um, we will uh, we'll see you later. All right. Yep. Sounds good. Cool. Thanks for having Thanks me. Thanks so much, dude. Bye.